is going on everybody welcome back to another real talk hosted by yours truly brandon gross we have an amazing guest today his name is howard pinsky if you guys are not familiar with him he is the senior xd evangelist at adobe and i'm super excited to have him here as a guest today to talk to you about how he jump started his career how he built his brand to really get to where he is today we're going to talk a little bit also about the future of design ar vr ai and really where your eyes should be what you should be looking at and how you can really just start pioneering in these spaces so with that said let's get into today's conversation my name is howard pinsky i am a design evangelist at adobe been there for about four and a half years now previously i was teaching photoshop i started teaching photoshop about 16 years ago so it's a nice natural progression to uh, the job i'm in now yeah, man. What we're here to talk about is the future of design, but I want to also kind of dive into, before we get into that, how important I think it is. And you're just one of the people that I think is kind of like, the idol is the wrong word, but it's what's coming to mind, but it's, it's pretty much that. But when I see people in the field where it's just like they were able to use content or like they're the thing that they were passionate about to pull them into the career path that they're currently in, you're one of the people where I'm just like, man, Howard is almost like a blueprint. There we go. An idled blueprint of how you I'll were able it. to, to <laughs> take it, man. It's as good as waffles and pancakes. Um, it's a nice little ego boost in the morning slash afternoon. Mm -hmm. all right? We're, trying, we're trying to get you that energy for the day. Um, but uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you started to, and this is more so a little bit more for me, um, and I think the audience can take something from it as well. You started creating content on really Photoshop, education there. And we talked a little bit about this on your Twitter spaces a little bit. Um, but first off, why did you decide to do that? And did you expect to, and this might not have been where it turned, might not have been like, uh, what's gonna call it? In my mind, I just see your content online. And I'm sure Adobe saw this and were like, wow, this is somebody we probably need internally. And that ended up like, turning your career into doing what you were doing on YouTube, but for the Adobe brand. That's how I see it. Is that kind of what had happened as well? Or is there a total other story that nobody really knows about? And you just like, yeah. Well, so sort what of. happened with that? I just see that. Okay, give us the full, so full there, there, slash half story. If you go from the start <laughs> to the end, it's, it's more or less that. But there was a whole roller coaster in between. So I started teaching Photoshop 16 years ago, like I mentioned. And yeah. at the time, YouTube was brand new. So there was basically nobody. I think it was me and Nathaniel Dodson uh, who started uploading Photoshop tutorials to YouTube. And I did it because I was in college. I was studying 3D animation, going through a rough time in my life. So I had to drop college for a little bit and I needed something to oh, keep wow. my mind occupied. So I, you know, YouTube again was new. So I just jumped on there. I knew Photoshop really well. So I decided to upload a video and see what the heck happened. And it was an ugly video. It was terrible. It was, you know, the quality sucked. It was four by three, you could, basically a bunch of pixels on the screen. And, you know, the comments reflected that. I was brand new to this whole thing. The video is still there, actually. You can go watch it. It's, it's brutal. But, um, you know, I just saw, want to see what happened. And it kind of snowballed from there, probably because nobody was doing it. So, you know, that kind of caught on. I was doing that for a few years. And at the beginning, I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, it was just something as a hobby. So yeah. I had no expectations at all. I just figured it would keep my mind busy for a little bit and I'd figure something else out. And at some point, I think in 2008, YouTube introduced monetization on the platform. So that allowed me to do it sort of for a living. You know, at one point I was, I was making decent money for, you know, a 19, 20 year old living in his parents' basement, essentially. Um, and that eventually connected me with my wife and uh, well, girlfriend at the time. And, you know, things kind of blossomed from there. So life kind of shifted a little bit to focus on that. Yeah. Um, and then I think it was in 2012, YouTube's algorithm changed. A lot more people were on the platform. So my content just started plummeting. Um, so I needed to make some sort of a shift. So I think in 2014, I landed a job at a marketing, like a YouTube marketing company. <clears throat> yeah, my voice is going already. I haven't even been speaking for very long. <laughs> it's um, Monday, Howard. It is Monday. <laughs> the rest of the week is going to be rocky. I know. Um, 
2014 to about 20, I did, did that for about four years. So I don't know what that is, 2018, something like that. And around that time, Adobe XD was starting to kind of get introduced. I was at Max, I think it was in 2015 when they introduced it. And I'm like, this looks kind of interesting. I'm going to start making videos on Adobe XD and see what happened. Cause you know, I did the yeah. Photoshop thing previously and I kind of knew that Adobe wasn't really looking for additional Photoshop instructors. They have plenty of them. Um, so I figured, you know, XD is new. Let's see what happens. So I made a video. The first video was actually, let's try to break XD because it was so powerful. Um, and I think that caught the eye of somebody at Adobe. So I started talking with them and it kind of just went from there. I love it, man. And we'll, we'll, we'll cap it there. We'll give your, your, your voice a little bit of a, a, a break. And if you need to take another water break, please do. I'll, I'll, I'll take it from here. Going back to our conversation again, back on Twitter, we were talking about like the future of things, like hopping on things early. And I was thinking about our conversation after the fact. And I was like, well, a great example of getting to things early was just what you said. You went to Max, you saw this new product, and you were like, let's see if we can break this sucker, and we started making videos on it. And that caught the, your pioneership, me making up words for today. Um, it works. You know, yeah, like diving into it, seeing what you can do with it. And, uh, you know, on your platform, it caught the eye of somebody, and look where you are now. So I, I wanted to bring that up because, one, pioneer, pioneering things when they're so early on is, is super important. Um, I want to take that that little point and kind of go run with it when we talk about the, the future of design um, and where you see things. Um, but I think it's also important, like, building some sort of brand or I don't know what word you would use it. But uh, I know it gets lumped into branding, but actually getting some thought leadership into, like, getting known for something. I guess that's what you call branding. <laughs> but it's just, you know, you were known for education, for Photoshop, then you took that those skills and applied it to educating on this new product in this new space. Um, and, you know, now we have, and guys, for those of you who are listening, take that, take whatever you can out of that, like try to build an expertise in the new things that are happening because there's mm. just so much opportunity. Like Howard just mentioned in his story, as he was starting on the YouTube platform, everything was brand new. And because he was one of the pioneers, his channel pop, was popping. And then, it, you know, more people started to come in. His, his platform is still popping and still is one of the uh, popping ones. But he got his foot in the door very early while other people had to catch up. With these, a lot of these, a few things that we might touch on, whether it be AI, no code, however Howard wants to turn the, uh, the conversation in a couple seconds, you know, these are the new opportunities in which to get your foot in the door. So I wanted to start with your story, how to get your foot in the door, what that really looked like, and then we can move into uh, really just what you're looking at for the future of things. I know we talked a little bit about AI. Um, I'm very interested in no-code sort of things as well. I know we talked a, a little bit about that um, behind some closed doors a bit ago, but what are you focused on as the what is important to you because obviously you do what you do on a, a high level on day to day, but what like when you look at what's going on, on the internet, what are you like? Damn, <laughs> like, I like you just start drooling the fact uh, that these things are now kind of circulating. What are you getting your hands dirty with nowadays? Yeah, it's interesting because things are changing so quickly. You know, we're seeing the emergence of AR and VR, and you know it's been around for a little bit, but I think it's really starting to grow. And I have a feeling over the next few years, it's going to explode as companies like Apple and Meta and P Google possibly. I mean, remember Google came out with the Google Glass years and years and years ago. And um, I think those sorts of things are necessary for the industry to start evolving. You know, it was, I would probably consider the Google Glass a failure back then, but you have to have these failures in order to eventually succeed because I would imagine the introduction of Google Glass, even though it was so far ago, it probably sparked conversations internally at other companies like mm. Meta, or I guess Facebook at the time and Apple. And you know, these sorts of things have to happen. You'll look at Samsung's flip phone, right? Obviously yeah. the Motorola phone, the razor from back in the day, that's obviously, you know, that exists, but Samsung tried to do something similar and the first one completely failed. But 
the next one a little bit better, the next one a little bit better. I think I have the, the newest one and it's decent, right? So all these so yeah. sorts of things have to happen. These failures have to happen in order to get to the success. And I think we're almost at that success phase where we're gonna see Apple introduce a really sleek looking AR headset. And I think that's gonna really, when things are going to start exploding. And even though we're not at that phase just yet, I think we as designers and product managers and engineers and everyone in the field has to prepare for that. We have to start kind of exploring what AR experiences could look like. And some of the technology is there, you know, Meta has their headsets and there's, you know, HTC Vives and all these sorts of things. But right. we have to really start thinking about that sphere. And, you know, I haven't do dove too far into it yet, but I've been thinking a lot about it because I want to be ready when that time comes to start designing experiences for AR. And I think AR is going to be a little bit more interesting and maybe challenging to design than right. VR. Because with VR, you're putting on this headset and you're essentially immersed in this 3D world. Maybe, you know, sometimes it could be 2D, but it's mostly a 3D world. But AR, you're blending almost that with reality. So you have to keep in mind that there, you know, you have to, there are going to be challenges with that because people are going to be walking down the street wearing glasses you don't want to obstruct their vision too much. You, you want to make sure the right information is fed to them at the right times. Um, it's going to be interesting. So AR and VR is definitely something I have my pulse on. And then AI, you know, that just came, kind of came out of nowhere. Obviously, again, it's been around for a little bit, but it feels like the last few months, it just went poof, exploded all yeah. over the place. And I don't think anyone really has any idea what the heck is going on with this thing. Um, <laughs> There are artists who are terrified. There are artists who are excited. There are regular people who have no idea what this AI stuff is, what it means, where it's going, how it came to be. I don't even know, I don't know what's happening right now. Um, and it seems like, you know, I mentioned this during the Twitter space. It seems like every week it's getting better, like exponentially mm -hmm. better than it was the week before, which is also terrifying. So I, I think we have to figure out how this plays into our lives because it's not going away. You know, it's yeah. as Can't we've put seen the genie back in getting, the bottle. Yeah, it's getting better and better every week. And now we have things like stable diffusion, which you can literally download the model locally on your computer. So even though even if like mid journey and Dolly gets shut down overnight, stable diffusion is local. So it's yeah, it's not going away. So we have to figure out how to one, protect artists that are currently living and trying to earn a living. I think that's very important. But also, how do we incorporate this AI technology into our day-to-day -day lives and benefit from it? Because, you know, there might be a time where AI, in some cases, takes over our jobs. And I think that's just the reality of humanity. It might not be in five years from now. It might be 20 or 30. Who knows? I mean, things just, as we've seen over the last few months, it could just take a wild ride and just overnight we're just doomed two years but, yeah, you never know um but we have to kind of prepare for that and in the meantime figure out how to work with the ai as weird as that sounds to uh yeah. you know do better work it's it's crazy man so it, and there's a million ways we can take the the conversation but i'm trying to we got like 12 ish minutes so i'm gonna try to squeeze as much as much good stuff as i can out here i'm not even sure how to ask this question but because you're so interested in the ar vr and you're also a very heavy learner so i'm sure you're probably as much as i am on youtube just like just playlists of just like save later watch later like you know what's going on who are some of the people that you are watching in the ar vr space or maybe even maybe people who are watching this who they should also be watching or maybe some things that they should be watching at adobe as well maybe some some things that uh, you want to point them towards to maybe potentially learn so they could also become a little bit of pioneers themselves or just early learners. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I haven't been watching anyone specific. Um, I do a lot of searches on YouTube and Dribble and Behance to try to find interesting experiences that are currently being made. And obviously I have, yeah. uh, you know, one of the Meta Quest 2, I think, uh, one of their headsets. And so I'm trying to immerse myself into that world as much as possible. But I don't think there's anyone specific that I have like a go-to for yeah. AR and VR content. I should probably start finding those people, but it's just a lot of random content from YouTube. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with 
I'm with you on that too because while I asked the question, I was like, I don't think I have a specific person either. I was like, I know there's this. Uh, I'll link it in the description. I know there's this girl that I follow on Instagram, and she does some really crazy AR stuff. You probably know her too. I think she has done some. Uh, Man, I have to figure out. But she does, like, some very weird, in a good way, AR and AI things. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, the last thing I saw from her, she did, like, a. Um, I think there's a lot of these on, on the internet now. But the last thing I remember is she went to a conference, and she had, like, these earrings with, like, QR codes. And when you scanned that, she had a particular dress on where, like, if you looked at her with your phone after scanning the QR code... Uh, her dress basically and she matched it perfectly it was actually a um i think she self-funded the project it was supposed to be a client project but they dropped it and it became this thing so um if you looked at her dress her dress would like oh basically her chest would mechanically open up and her heart would be like uh what's gonna call it you could her inner workings or her inner workings the, you could see like inside of her and she would be like mechanical it was really well done i, I thought it was gonna be like this is not gonna be any good right but she did um it was awesome and I'll, I'll i'll post it in the in the description so you guys can find her but like howard said there's just so many random uh cool things out there where it's just really hard to just just give it to one person there's a lot going on guys just and that's kind of the thing i'm blank. sorry to interrupt brandon but that's kind of the no, thing i'm ahead. excited for about ar is you know once we have glasses or even contact lenses that are not these massive things that you have to wear you know goofy walking around but once you have those yeah. that hardware in place all these experiences are going to be possible you know you're going to be able to walk around and people's clothes are going to start explode not not in a weird way but <laughs> like like the way you were talking about with like we hear I you mean, we hear you Howard. <laughs> um and that there, there's just an unlimited amount of possibilities like on the very basic level i think i mentioned this during our twitter space is yeah i'm terrible with names and you know i'll, I'll be you know these this experience i'll just you know on the on the little display in front of my face it'll just kind of remind me of who that person is that i'm walking up to um but then there's these these crazy things that you'll be able to i mean i don't want to think about it but you know advertisements might show up in um random places as you're walking around. Obviously, you know, I don't want to necessarily see that part of the AR experience, but um, yeah. I can't even think of everything that AR is going to unlock. And I think that's really exciting. Sky, navigation, yeah. as you're walking around a street, you don't have to look down at your phone constantly. Uh, who knows what else? I mean, these crazy rave experiences you might go to, like in your own bedroom or something, you'd just be able to see all these like, you know, bands in front of you, basically. It could, could I don't know. I'm just kind of like rambling because I'm trying to wrap my mind around all the possibilities of AR, but I don't think it's even possible. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. And I guess the last question here, because uh, I think this also too will, will take some time, but where do you, with the excitement of AR, VR, and, and, and we're kind of both in the same place, right? We're, we're both doing, we're both builders and educators within the web design space, right? Um, and also, you know, I'll, I'll kind of answer this first where it's just like, I also too have a hard pull towards this new area of interestingness, we'll call it, of, of almost infinite possibilities. And I think even almost tugs at the heartstrings of being more so of an artist with a very almost unlimited canvas. You, there's a lot that can be done there. Whereas, you know, with how we're doing like web design now yes we do you know it, it seems a little bit i don't even know how to frame it where it's just like the excitement that's on the other side like the grass is greener of this new future stuff where it's just like you know ui ux web design it's still cool but it seems a little limited and i feel like the pool and you know howard you can tell me like brand i don't answer this question <laughs> we will not we, we don't have to do it but you know i almost feel myself like wanting to be pulled to that other green patch and start messing around with stuff there and kind of almost leave like how how much more can web design improve i don't know i don't know the answer to that i feel like there is a cap on what can be done there and i just feel like the unlimited possibilities and the potential of the ar vr ai is so exciting 
do you think like where does web design and UI UX still fit? Obviously, that's going to be there for a very long time before mm-hmm. the other stuff becomes mainstream. But you know, how do you think about that whole thing for yourself? Are you, do you feel just as much as a pool as well as kind of like I'm talking about? You know, where do you see like the UI UX web design stuff kind of moving? towards the future does it move in and get lumped into the ar vr stuff or does it stay as is and just mutate and evolve in its uh the way that it is how do you think about that stuff yeah i think we will start to see a little bit of a shift but i think like you said you know the current ui and ux and websites and mobile apps and things like that they'll kind of be there for quite a while um because we have to remember you know similar to our parents kind of growing older and getting sick of all the newer technology, we might yeah. as well, right? Or at least a lot of our generation are you're going to get older. They don't want to deal with the AR and the VR. They just want a website. It's kind of like how our parents right. read newspapers, right? We're, we're going to read, uh, you know, regular websites where our kids are like, just put on an AR headset and just like take in the news that way. Um, just download it, gonna, grandma. Right. <laughs> we're, we're think. I think we're going to start to see more immersive experiences that it might not be a massive jump initially, but it'll be yeah. something a little bit more. I mean, we can probably do some of this stuff now with our phones where if we're on a website and we want to maybe actually we, we kind of have this now with, uh, you know, like Wayfair, for example, if you're on Wayfair browsing for furniture, you see something really cool that you like, you can press a button, it'll scan your room and it'll show you that piece of furniture in your room. Um, so I think we're going to start to see more of that where it kind of blends the traditional mobile apps and mm. websites with AR experiences. And then there will be a leap at some point where, again, sticking with this Wayfair idea, you'll have this headset on and you'll just be able to essentially browse through a list of furniture. It'll automatically update in your room. Maybe the entire room will transform and you can walk around it. You can look around the different furniture and things like that. And it'll look relatively real. Um, I don't know how far we are from that. I think the the hardware is necessary to evolve, yeah. but I'm I'm not feeling a massive pull in that direction just yet, but it's definitely starting to tug. Yeah, I feel you, man. All right, so last thing, we got four minutes left. What would you, is there anything out of our entire conversation or maybe even before we had the conversation, is there something that we have not touched on or that you wanted to say and you haven't had the chance to say it just yet? Is there anything that you would like to leave to close out this conversation or all this One stuff? One final tidbit. I, I would say trust failure. And mm-hmm. it sounds kind of strange, but I look back often at my life and everything that I've done and I, I have failed a lot. You know, like I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, I dropped out of college and I would consider that a failure. There were other things during that time that I would consider those major failures. And I could have, you know, called it quits. And I, you know, thought about that for a little bit, but I tried to take those failures and spin them in such a way where I wanted to learn from them. And maybe that's, you know, the educator in me, but I use those failures to improve, not just in the immediate future, but also years and years and, you know, a decade down the line. And as we go into this world of AI and AR and VR and who knows what else, I mean, I can't even imagine the technology that's going to come in the next 5, 10, 15 years. There are going to be a lot of failures. You know, people are going to try to create new things. They're going to fail. Google Glass, like we were talking about earlier, that I would consider a failure, but it's something you have to learn from, you know, figure out what went wrong and try to try again, right? And you might fail again, but keep going at it. And I think it's really important to, you know, I think you have to fail. I don't think any, any successful person has not failed. And if you, you know, if you keep working at it and I, I think it'll, uh, it'll pay off. 100%. I'm not going to steal anything from that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Howard Pinsky. Trust failure and be an everlasting learner. So we'll leave it from there. And uh, thank you so much, Howard, for giving us some of your time today. And we hope that your throat gets a little bit better. <laughs> it seems okay now, but, you know, I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. You just needed a couple of drinks of water. The water, you know, is, is, is important. I've had a lot of tea today and, uh, yeah, it, water is, is needed. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. And uh, that's it. Of course, it was great talking to you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys enjoyed that amazing conversation with Howard Pinsky. If you guys want to learn more about Howard or find him on the internet, you can check out the links down in the description and uh, go see what he's talking about over on Twitter, the YouTube space, or everything that he's doing in the YouTube and Adobe stratosphere. So with that said, check out more from Howard down below. Peace.